Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Sitting on top of a hill overlooking the California coast is the estate of San Simeon, the dream of newspaper mogul William Randolph Hearst. The site had been in the family for many decades, and this wealthy mining family used it for camping, as sort of a reminder of their humble roots. But in 1919, the family began a series of construction projects, the jewel of which would become known as Hearst Castle. Designed by architect Julia Morgan, the style is romantic. The castle is a collaboration between Morgan and Hearst that started in 1919 and went on to just about his death in 1951. In his 50s at this time, Hearst said he was just getting too old for camping and wanted one of those ultimate bungalows. But his ambitions and avarice increased as the project went on. There is a collection of some 3,700 letters and telegrams documenting the professional relationship between Hearst and Morgan. And Draftsman, working for Morgan, said that the design meetings between the two were amiable and creative. And this furthers my theory that great architects need a great client who will express their views and their goals and then let the architect be the architect. William Randolph Hearst parlayed his large inheritance into an empire of newspapers, radio stations, and movie studios. He was the first great media magnet. For those of you who need an explanation, Newspapers were the primary and most powerful tool for dispensing information in the 19th and 20th centuries. Like social media today, it was addictive. And while you got a lot of information, it was not necessarily always truth. People's noses were buried into them constantly, the same way people stare at their smartphones today. So if Hearst was around today to see Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey acquire their mega worth, his reaction might be, been there, done that, and I don't wear t-shirts. Much of the original 40,000 acres of the San Simeon estate was turned into a working ranch, orchard, and farm, and that part remains in the family today. George Hearst created the massive wealth of the family through mining, and his wife Phoebe Hearst and their son William Randolph traveled extensively in Europe, which began their fascination with collecting art. As a widow, Phoebe, a suffragette, managed the family's fortune and was quite generous to many institutions, including the University of California, Berkeley. Here she discovered the young architecture student, Julia Morgan. In 1913, Julia Morgan was commissioned by Phoebe Hearst to design the YWCA Asilomar in Pacific Grove, where eventually Morgan would do 16 buildings. The dynamic women of the region were quick to engage Morgan for many of their construction projects. Julia Morgan went on to over 700 commissions with many YWCA's, Young Women's Christian Associations, private homes, and other building types. So let's state the obvious. There weren't many women architects in her era, and so the moneyed women were delighted to support such a talent who was breaking down the barriers. Julia Morgan early on had great skill in math and physics, and encouraged by an architect relative, she studied civil engineering at the University of California at Berkeley. She was the first woman to graduate with such a degree. Encouraged by her mentor there, architect Bernard Maybeck, she applied and through her diligence and repeated efforts, became the first woman in the architecture school of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, where most of the prominent architects of the 19th century had been schooled. It was no easy task to overcome the discrimination, but by achieving excellence, she made it impossible for the men to dismiss her. In 1904, she became the first woman to be a licensed architect in California. And to avoid the prejudice of other architects and their low pay for women, she started her own firm. This was 16 years before the 19th Amendment, which guaranteed the right to vote for women. Looking at her work, you could not tell that it was designed by a woman. And this makes perfect sense, because architecture, as Vitruvius said, was about firmitas, utilitas, and venustas. 
stability, commodity, and delight. It is a skill of ideas and technology. It is not about gender. Like other arts and crafts and romantic style architects, such as Green and Green, whose gamble house we saw in Architecture Codex video number 59. Her style, as well as the opulence of Hearst himself, went out of fashion by the Depression era of the 1930s. She was not really recognized in her lifetime and only got the AIA Gold Medal Award in 2014, almost 60 years after her death, and naturally was the first woman to do so. This is particularly interesting because Julia Morgan practiced traditional architecture, and the AIA awards generally ignore that style currently. Hearst Castle was an ebullient social center for the rich, powerful, and famous for decades, and not the dark, depressing Xanadu depicted in Orson Welles' treatment of Hearst in his movie Citizen Kane. After 1926, William Hearst's wife, Millicent, remained in New York as Hearst's mistress, actress Marion Davies, became the Chatelaine, the woman in charge of the castle. With relaxed social standards and limited amounts of alcohol, San Simeon became the epitome of what the Roaring Twenties were about. Guests were accommodated in luxury, well-fed, and could partake in many activities, such as golf, horseback riding, shooting, swimming, tennis, and more. And there was probably some sex going on, but I have not read that in any official brochure. At San Simeon, construction was a challenge because of the remoteness of the site. So Morgan established concrete, brick, and tile works at the location to produce the materials they needed to build. She also built warehouses and quarters for the laborers. This was a town built to create another town, the massive complex of buildings that became legendary. The castle is an amalgam of different buildings and different historic styles, all anchored by the Casa Grande, favoring what could be called Spanish colonial. Pushing the design to more sophisticated but less ornament, Morgan drew upon her experience in the École de Beaux-Arts for their emphasis on traditional architecture, even though a more austere modernism was coming to fruition in America and Europe. But the project at San Simeon went on for decades, and so there was great opportunity to execute her eclectic design skills. The Casa Grande began construction in 1922, and like most of the buildings at San Simeon, would go through the constant expansion and renovation until William Randolph Hearst's death. Built on top of the hill, this four-story, 68,000 square foot house was primarily a concrete structure. Morgan had excelled among her peers in the use of concrete. Faced in stone, it is historic and romantic without being overdone. And the two symmetrical cupolas herald the Spanish Baroque influence, looking more like a Latin American church than a house. Hearst, while good at magnifying wealth, was far more proficient in spending it lavishly. It reminds me of what I've seen in some family businesses, where the patriarch knows how to save every penny, and the children know how to spend every dime. So many of the rooms inside the Casa Grande were as spectacular as the facade, such as the 2,500 square foot assembly room, which features a fireplace purchased from a chateau in Burgundy and a ceiling from an Italian palazzo. The room displayed other art purchased by the Hearsts as they scoured Europe for gravitas. It fell to Morgan's staff to catalog Hearst's immense collection as it arrived in California in crate after crate after crate. The refectory, the main dining room, also featured an Italian ceiling. And you can go on and on about the lavish details in dozens of other rooms, all featuring trinkets Hearst would buy and would be carefully and cleverly assembled by Morgan in the deep and fecund romanticized style appropriate to the artifact. San Simeon is also known for some extraordinary pools. In 1924, Hearst instructed Morgan with some specific ideas regarding the outdoor pool to be a Roman garden, and apparently supplied some authentic statue copies. Morgan wrote back about the progress that Mr. Neptune and the two ladies can be placed, but the finished basins will take some time yet. The Neptune Pool was later reconstructed in 1934. 
The pool portrayed a Roman villa in Stanley Kubrick's 1960 movie Spartacus. The Roman pool is an indoor affair inspired by the ancient Roman baths with mosaics inspired by the late Roman art perfected in Ravenna. It is very blue, and I wonder if the swimmers felt as if they were in a decadent Roman bath or perhaps some um, aquatic cathedral. It certainly was a long way from the pools Morgan would have designed for the average YWCA. Three guest houses were built as special accommodations for family and friends, all of which faced the Casa Grande with a single-story facade that dropped off into multiple stories as the building cascaded down the hill. They are all different, and I can imagine Morgan and her staff having fun getting stylistic on each of the casas. None of the guest houses had kitchens to encourage all the guests to dine together, particularly on Saturday evening. But that meant if you were staying at a house and wanted some tea and crumpets, the maid would have to go up to the main house in order to fetch them. Really? How gauche. Casa del Monte, the first of the houses, certainly evokes the idealized haciendas of an imagined Mexican California, as false but as romantic as the legend of Zorro. Casa del Mar was the temporary home of the Hearst family while Casa Grande was built and is different as it is white, less terracotta. Casa del Sol tends to Moorish style, probably inspired by Granada's Alhambra, which you can see literally in the lion fountain, except Hearst's fountain has just four lions and not the twelve at the Alhambra. Slacker! For Julia Morgan, Hearst Castle is a dynamic legacy, a crown jewel for her body of work. Imagine if one architect was given the commission to design Mont Saint Michel, Architecture Codex video number 25, or even the Alhambra, Architecture Codex video number 61. If the legacy of building lavish buildings for the Hearst family is distasteful to some, history has given us plenty of examples where great wealth has been amassed and used to create beauty. In one sense, the Hearst family was like the Medici of Florence, the Tsars of Russia, or even the pharaohs of Egypt, employing architects and artists to create beauty. And what architect can say no to an opportunity like that? I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex. Thank you.